January 15th, 2009. U.S. Airways Flight 1549 departs from LaGuardia International Airport at 1524. 56. Less than three minutes later, at 1527, 11, the airplane strikes a flock of geese, taking out both engines of the aircraft. At 3.27.33, Captain Solenberger cries out, Mayday, Mayday, to the flight control. Three minutes later, he comes over the speaker to the 150 passengers flying that day with three words. Brace for impact. 90 seconds later, 3.31. U.S. Airways Flight 1549 lands in the Hudson River. Pilots are given specific instructions as to how they are to view what is before their aircraft, what is behind their aircraft, where it is they are going and where it is they have come from. One of the techniques in having the best focus possible is through using visual scanning. One guide describes it this way. The probability of spotting a potential collision threat increases with the time spent looking outside, but certain techniques may be used to increase the effectiveness of the scan time. Effective scanning is accomplished with a series of short regularly spaced eye movements that bring successive areas of the sky into the central vision field. The human eye tends to focus somewhere even in a featureless sky. If there is nothing specific on which to focus, your eyes revert to a relaxed intermediate focal distance of 10 to 30 feet. This means that you are looking without actually seeing anything, which is dangerous. In order to be most effective, the pilot should shift glances and refocus at intervals. Shifting the area of focus at regular intervals between the instrument panel and then refocusing outside of the aircraft. When doing this, it alleviates the problem. Captain Sollenberger, on January 15th, 2009, did everything he could and his co-captain beside him 
to fa stay focused on what was before them. The geese somehow came out of nowhere and instantly were upon them without any ability to know of their presence beforehand. The collision was not their fault, but what was a success was the way that Captain Sollinger regained focus after the collision in the sky. Captain Solinger immediately sought out information from the air traffic controllers. He learned that there were two airports within a relatively close distance, and they were given clearance at both of those airports to land in specific runways that were available. But in checking the rate at which the plane was descending and in checking the distance of those airports, they were not a feasible option for safe landing. And so what Sollenberger did is he saw the only runway that was before him. In one interview, he says it was long enough, it was wide enough, and it was smooth enough. And so, in an instant, Captain Sollenberger made a decision to cast his vision on the only runway he saw fit the Hudson River, and in 90 seconds using the only control that remained to be functional, the lever which controlled the nose of the plane, upon descending toward the river, he glided in with the nose upright and a safe landing into the Hudson River. Captain Sollinger never lost focus of his runway. The creatures in our scripture reading for today never lose focus of their praise. Their sights are always set on the one who is worthy of glory and honor and thanksgiving. Our scripture reading for today comes out of Revelation 4, verses 6b through 11. And it says this. <clears throat> Around the throne and on each side of the throne are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion. The, seven, the second living creature like an ox the third living creature like a human face, and the fourth living creature like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each of them had six wings, are full of eyes all around and inside, day and night, without ceasing. They sing, holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall before the one who is seated on the throne 
and worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, singing, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. This scripture reading shows us how praise can be multiplied. In the beginning of the text that we read together, we have four creatures that are singing day and night, holy, holy, holy. And before long, we see that there are 24 elders laying their crowns before this same throne. Similarly, singing and praising the Lord God Almighty. And if you move ahead on into chapter 5, which is a continuation of the vision that John has received of heavenly worship, we learn that many angels join in this singing. It says this in verse 11, then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders they numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands singing with full voice. Worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. These Thousands and thousands and thousands, myriads upon myriads upon myriads of voices join in singing. The elders fall to their knees because of the example of these four living creatures. Because these four Living creatures began to sing. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands joined in the singing. The four living creatures' example of glory and honor and thanks provoked the elders to fall to their knees and provoked the angels to lift up their voices in singing. They were an example with their six wings, an illustration of power and protection or guard. They were an example in their own voices, persistent voices. It tells us that they sang day and night. They praised without ceasing. Their song was raised on high continuously. That kind of perseverance provokes others to join in the singing. But it's not only their wings or their voices that orchestrate this mighty chorus, but it's where their eyes stayed focused, and their eyes stayed focused on the glory and the honor and the thanksgiving of the one, the Lord God Almighty. That kind of 
focus caused the others to join in this praise, in this song, in this worship. These eyes for seeing who God is, is important. Our text alone mentions it twice, right? It says in verse 6 that they are full of eyes in front and behind. And in verse 8, it says that they are full of eyes all around and inside. So even their spirit, their soul could see who their God was. John Wesley talks about how these eyes, the, the number, the, mult, the many, many numbers of eyes that are seen in this scripture are representative of their desire to have a knowledge of that God. Their desire to have the wisdom of that God. And the eyes that were before them were specifically meant to stay focused on what was ahead of them their God, their Lord Almighty. We see this importance of casting our eyes on God, not only from those creatures, but also when we look at what John is writing, right? This is a vision that John receives from Christ. This is a vision of heavenly worship that John is supposed to share in our scripture. It says this in uh, verse 1 of chapter 4. After this, I looked. What happens when we don't look? We don't see. We don't see, we don't receive God's vision. We don't receive God's vision, we can't do God's will. Thank God, John looked, right? It tells us in verse 1, after this, I looked, and there in heaven a door stood open. John was able to see through the door because he looked. And in that verse I just read to you, 11 of chapter 5, then I looked, and I heard a voice of many resounding angels. If John wouldn't have looked, he would have never seen that myriad of voices. And so John, not only the four creatures, give us the importance of keeping our eyes open. And not only keeping our eyes open, but keeping our eyes on the runway before us. The vision of our Lord God Almighty. The chapter just before this shows us a community who didn't so much have their eyes open. The church of Laodicea, we are told, is what? Luke warm. And in a further description of being lukewarm, Jesus, through John, tells them that they are wretched. Ouch. That's a strong word, right? That they are poor. That they are pitiful. And that they are blind. And that if they are to recover from being wretched and poor and pitiful and blind, that they are going to need a salve for their eyes so that they might be opened and see and have their vision set on the one who is. Now, we can say that we aren't like the church of Laodicea. 
And in many ways, we are not. But in many ways, we are. Listen, the truth is we live in a first world country, right? And for the most part, we're pretty comfortable in our air-conditioned homes and our eight-passenger SUVs. Yeah? And the second truth is that we live in a free country. And the predominant religion is Christianity. And so none of us have been persecuted for our faith. So let me tell you what happens when we're really comfortable and we're not persecuted. We aren't being burned and we're not freezing cold in hunger or in fear. So what does that make us? Luke 1. There is no fire or excitement. There is nothing poking or persevering. It's comfortable and easy. It's lukewarm. And so then we can move on in the text and say, okay, so maybe we can be lukewarm like five of the seven days of the week. But I'm definitely not ever wretched or poor or pitiful or blind. Right? But have any of us gossiped this week or been bitter this week? right? Or angry this week. And so there are moments, and there can even be moments that grow into seasons, where we are wretched in spite. And I know that we have experienced grief and loss in this life. Our physical mortal bodies don't live forever. So we have loved ones who have passed. And so while we might not be poor financially, we have seasons where we are poor in grief. Jesus says that himself in the Beatitudes on his Sermon on the Mount, right? We are poor in spirit. And while we are a wealthy country with good insurance and a strong medical field, cancer still exists, right? And as we age, our knees and our hips go bad. Anybody? And so we're pitiful, rightly so, in our pain. And suddenly we aren't as comfortable as we once were. And we have fears that trigger our hearts when we receive that scary diagnosis. And so there is times, seasons in our lives where we are pitiful. And then lastly, we can experience a blindness in our soul. When these things accumulate, when relationships are broken, when we are in pain or when we are in grief or when we are spiteful, our eyes are closed to the one who is good and righteous and loving the one who is the lamb and the healer 
and the Father. This year, you all know, I have been through this season of being wretched and poor and pitiful and blind. When my father-in-law died 20 months ago, my response is, woe is me. Why did my husband have to lose his father and all of their future plans? Why do my sons not get to know their grandfather into their teenage years, into their adulthood? It was pitiful. I was poor because of what we lost in our future with my father-in-law. And then fast forward six months, eight months, and my process for ordination didn't quite go as planned. You all journeyed with me through that. Thank you. And my response in my days and, and some weeks after that hiccup, if you will, were seasons of spite and bitterness. And you know what that did? That caused me moments of being blind to the one who is good and righteous and loving. This spring, over spring break, I was given the opportunity, well, I gave, kind of gave myself the opportunity, honestly, to go on a cruise to celebrate my mom's 70th birthday. I know, you're like, she's 70, she looks good, right? Give it up for mama. So my mom and sister and I go on this cruise, and we decided to do an excursion where we would um, go to a state park in Cozumel, and uh, we would snorkel, and we would see a sea lion show, and then we'd have some time at the pool and beach and stuff at the park there. So the first uh, scheduled event for the day was the snorkeling. And we had a guide, and there was probably a group of 15 or 20 of us who were on this excursion, and we journeyed down to the beach and climbed uh, down a ladder into a harbor-like reef area. And the water was perfectly crystal blue clear as the day is long. And once everyone was into the water, our guide started directing us to where we would snorkel and then on to where we would get out of the water. And so we, were, we had some freedom to go where we wanted and look at what we wanted as long as we kept our eyes on him and stayed safe. He was comfortable with that. And so there were a number of things to look at in this coral reef. There was the coral and the rock formations that had organically grown over the centuries. There were fish, glorious fish, blues and greens and oranges weaving in and out of the coral. And you could watch those and, and see those and keep your eyes fixed on those things. And then, of course, there was the goal of keeping our watch on the guide. And these things were beautiful. They were safe for the moment as well. 
But as I swam in the current, (laughs) keeping up with the guide, I saw something deep down below. Our guide pointed it out. A statue of Jesus Christ. Everything else, the fish, the coral, the tide, which was a struggle at times, were a distraction from what was before me. And as I saw the crucified Jesus Christ waiting in the water. I paused. Nothing else mattered. I paused for the one who was before me. I paused for the one worthy to be praised. I paused and I prayed. I couldn't sing into the snorkel so I paused and I prayed, God, remove all the distractions, remove all the struggles, remove the wretchedness poor, the pity. Place the salve on my eyes that I may see, that I may see you, the one, the only, for you, who is worthy to be praised. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Let me pause to praise you. Captain Sollenberger. told his passengers, brace for impact. There are seasons where we are wretched. There are seasons where we are poor. There are seasons where we are pitiful, and there are seasons where we are blind. In those seasons, don't only brace, but pause. Pause. Seek. See. Praise the one who sits on heaven's throne. Pause for Jesus. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, we pause to praise 
you. Amen.